you're getting the hang of this by now. Hello and welcome to the third in my 21 for 21 series where I interview 21 Paralympians around the world to see how they're coping during this lockdown period. And in my career as a TV producer and radio reporter, I've met this guy a few times. He's currently on lockdown in Spain, which is where he plays his wheelchair basketball at club level. It's Rio bronze medalist, Gaz Chowdhury. Hi Gaz, how are you doing? I'm good, thanks. How are you, Andy? Yeah, not too bad, not too bad. It's funny times, isn't it? Strange times, but... Uh... Really? So paint a picture for us, Gaz. I mentioned that you're in Spain, obviously. That's where you play your, your club wheelchair basketball. But, but whereabouts are you and, and, and what are conditions like there? Um, so I'm in Albacete, Spain, uh, which is sort of in between Madrid and the coast, the Alicante. Um, I'm in this kind of small, small city, I would say. Um, but yeah, things have been tough. We've been kind of quarantined a week before the UK got quarantined. Um, so, and it's been a bit of a stricter quarantine than the UK. So we haven't been allowed out, um, for exercise or anything like that. We can walk the dog, which has been the kind of saving grace really. Um, but yeah, no, it, I've just been lucky that, um, my apartment has like a, a big terrace, so I've been able to get some fresh air. Um, I think without that, it's, it's so tough. Mm. And particularly tough, I guess, to have any sense of trying to keep fit as well, I guess. You know, it's not for you. It's not just going outside. It's actually, I guess, trying to keep active and, and fit as well, isn't it? Yeah. So um, I ordered um, some like exercise equipment for home. So I've got like a pull-up and a dip station. So just been hitting that. But um, I've been carrying an inch. Well, this sort of time of the year is always you know, the business end and you've got a lot of miles on your body. So I had, I had a few niggles. So the, the good thing about this is it's take, giving me a chance to kind of like address those and, and take care of some of those niggles, especially my wrist. Um, it's been really, I suppose. A dip station sounds like something you'd find at Pizza Hut, but I'm imagining your dip station is, is not quite as enjoyable as that. Oh, mate, it's really not. You just See, there's no Pizza Hut. So we haven't got any, like, Just Eat delivery or anything open, right? So you're killing me right now. Like, I would, <laughs> yes, a pizza or Pizza Hut would be heaven right now. <laughs> <laughs> and are you able to practice any basketball at all? You know, do you even have a net or anything? No, nothing. So our chairs, so basically where we were in a team meeting, um, it, it was less of a meeting and more just telling us, look, this quarantine is going to happen. Uh, we're going to shut everything down, um, which is the Thursday. I can't remember the date, but it was on a Thursday. Uh, the sort of, uh, and we met at like 6 p.m. Um, in the actual sports hall or the arena we play in and by six, and training. And 6.30, someone official from the city came down and said, evacuate this facility now. Uh, leave everything in the facility so our chairs are all locked up I haven't been able to get in my basketball chair um, for a month basically none of us have we can't access it. so the whole yeah so all of those kind of places have been uh, yeah shut down so no basketball chair I mean I've got a ball upstairs um, on the terrace so I've done some dribbling but apart from that nothing else um, it's been it's been tough I don't know if I'll fit in my chair to be fair <laughs> um, uh, when it's all said and done because um, cardio has been a real issue like conditioning you can do some you know you can do as many pull-ups as you want it's not the same so I mean with all that in mind was the um, was the year postponement of the games when that came through was that actually a bit of a relief because uh, had you been sort of worrying like you know if the games somehow carries on later this year how are we all going to get back into you know top fitness yeah, I think fitness wasn't, I mean, we, when they cancelled it, for our sport at least, there was enough time. I mean, our margins aren't, you know, hundredth of a second. Um, so we're not in like an empirical sport. So we had enough time to, sort of our selection date initially was the 23rd of June. Um, for the actual selection, that's when we would have known if we got selected to Tokyo or not. Um, so as long as you kind of get two solid months of getting in kind of basketball shape, um, would have been long enough. Um, so that wasn't really the worry. The big worry, though, was the fact that I know, for example, cer certain players in other nations have an advantage in terms of training. And, and it's not the physical. It's just like so some players are able to train. Some 
some nations are still don't have as hard a lockdown. So that was a bit of a worry for us. Um, but I think, I think the postponement less so from a performance standpoint, I think it was just, just the health and safety of everyone involved from players, fans, spectators, volunteers, journalists, a lot, you know, I think one of the big things for, for me was if, if, if being ill is a, is a feature of the games, it's not worth having them. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think there was no guarantee of that. And what's the knock-on effect uh, in terms of other uh, competitions and just training schedules? Is it all a little bit up in the air or, or can you kind of just lift what was going to happen in 2020 and put it into 2021? No, I mean, there's so 2021 is so on the cycle of things, it's the European Championship year, and Europeans are the qualification for the World Championships the following year. Um, no idea how that's going to work now. Um, are we going to have an early Europeans? Are we going to have a late Europeans? Um, they just announced last week officially that the Spanish season is done, so the final four club season all is completely done. Um, so in principle, without the Paralympics, we could start the domestic club seasons earlier. Mm-hmm. In principle, you could have the European Championships earlier before you go to the, the Paralympics. Do you think it will have much impact, though, on, on say, I mean, would you anticipate, certainly on the men's side, which you'll, you'll know more about, would you anticipate it being the same GB squad that goes to Tokyo 2021 as, as would have gone um, this August in 2020 or actually does it actually give room for one or two players to, to, to come in you know come in under the radar I guess in the next um, 12 18 months or so yeah I mean you never know and, and you know for our sport you know not just not just in terms of form and stuff but injuries so mm. are ha- happen as well I mean we've had a couple of situations where guys that were in the team didn't go because of health issues um, you just never know. And, and I suppose uh, the more time you have for emerging athletes, the better. So, you know, um, us as established athletes, um, I remember being the emerging athlete. So an extra year to prepare as an emerging athlete would, would definitely help. And in terms of the lockdown, are you in touch with any family friends in, in the UK? Or I'm not sure if you still have family in Pakistan, but are you, are you in touch with... <laughs> No, so you um, have people back in the UK about how, how things are going? Are they all Yeah, it's, it's good. A lot of house party games. Uh, we had a quiz night the other night, um, and I got accused of cheating on Google because uh, I, I won the quiz night. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> exactly. All these allegations. Um, no, but no, it's, it's good. So, like, it's so, so lucky with, you know, I was, we were just talking about it the other day um, in our WhatsApp group. Imagine this lockdown in the 90s, like mid 90s, where you would <laughs> not have any communication. Like, what would you do? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so it's been, it's been good. So, FaceTime, house party, Zoom calls, all that kind of stuff has been, I think, I think definitely uh, really helpful. Still been able to stay in touch. To be fair, I talk to my mom every day now, and it wasn't every day before. So, uh, so I'm probably talking to her more than I would um, normally. <laughs> You're winning some brownie points, much needed brownie <laughs> points. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> now, I know you did a degree in political science, didn't you? So are you watching all the different sort of approaches being taken around the world by various governments and thinking, mm, I think I could do better than that? Or Yeah, it's been interesting. Um, uh, yeah, so it's been interesting. We've, uh, we've got like, me and my group of friends are kind of all very similar, all from like... Um, in a city London, but all kind of, kind of got higher education and, and, and are, and are fairly curious minded. So we've had plenty of these kind of discussions. Um, I think it's just so hard, right. In terms of without having us, there seems to be no real scientific basis for what we should do. There isn't a clear, you know, you do this and this is going to happen. But I think one thing I remember when it was happening was because Spain got hit earlier. And I remember speaking to my mom and my friends and stuff. And I was like, look, take this seriously. The UK is going to be hit. Um, and, and from my perspective, just being in Spain, knowing the UK was a week behind, 
and just being concerned for the people that you know you love and care about in the UK. Um, I didn't understand why the UK didn't lock down earlier. Like it was like, look, just lock down now and prevent. Because it was like the financial implications as it's coming out now, you, you didn't really save the economy by delaying it a week. But I don't know. I don't know about, but again, I don't know the second wave. I don't know the immunity issue. Like, so, you know, I don't have all the information, but it was just from a purely, purely like, let's just prevent as many deaths as possible. I wish the UK would have shut down when Spain did before the kind of, you know, reaching a level of, of infection, but a virus spread. I don't know. And do you get a sense of how long you're going to be in lockdown there in Spain? You know, it feels like they've taken quite a hard line on things. So are you yeah. going, be, going to be there for a while? Yeah, but I mean, we have a... So so day before yesterday was only 500 deaths. And I say only, knowing full well the severity of 500 people dying. Mm. So that was a, a down. So we they the hope is that, you know, it's peaked and, and we're flattened out. So today I know certain businesses open. Um, so, so motorways are not open yet, um, so you can't travel freely, um, and a lot of shops aren't open yet. But I know certain factories have opened today, mm -hmm. certain things just to just to try and get the economy going again. And it's sort of a soft softening of the uh, the kind of um, the softening of the kind of kind of quarantine measures that Spain had taken, which are harsher than the UK anyway. I mean, one of the one of the positive things that has come out of all this, you know, here in the UK is is people are openly showing their gratitude and their affection to the NHS, and it, it's quite an interesting subject, I think, particularly for um, disabled people to talk about. I mean, I was I was discussing it with with Will Bailey the other day that, you know, he he owes his life really to Great Ormond Street Hospital as a child. You know, I know you've had an amputation. I've had lots of uh, medical treatment and prosthetics from from the nhs and it feels to me like actually disabled people probably have a bit of a natural affinity to the nhs already even before this massively like you know i owe my life to the nhs absolutely you know uh, uh i was at ucl in um in london uh i got all my kind of cancer treatment there all the lots of chemo everything and my invitation was done at royal national orthopedic in stanmore uh, and that place is still continues to be where I get my prosthetics from. Mm -hmm. um, so the NHS is so dear and, and it's been, it's, it's kind of mad, like all the kind of political, like you were mentioning the political stuff, all the kind of lead up to the politics. It, one of my biggest worries as a, as someone who owes their life to the NHS, um, kind of politics of economics aside, my real fear has always been the NHS becoming privatized. I have a lot of friends in the States, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and, and that is a genuine fear. It's, it's, it's been something that's actually worried me. Um, so, so hopefully this, this shows everyone that, you know, that's, that has to be off the table. You know, when Trump was mentioning, you know, everything is on the table of a trade deal. Mm -hmm. Like one of my biggest worries, genuine worries, you know, political leaning aside was the nhs and i hope it's not just kind of platitudes of you know let's clap for these guys i hope that we genuinely as a nation understand just how special the nhs is yeah here here on a lighter note then so looking ahead to the next sort of few days and weeks what's the what are the gas chowdhury sort of uh, recommendations for things to watch or listen to or read or what how are you filling your time apart from the the dog right so I actually have my schedule for today, so I've been I've taken to, to 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 sort of not blend all the days into one. It was like one big mushy leftover shepherd's pie in the fridge of a day. Every day was like that. So I made an actual schedule Brilliant. today. So my day starts with walking my dog, which is great. Uh, and I had to do a shop today, so some fresh uh, produce which I was able to do. Um, I'm doing my Spanish lessons, so trying to improve my Spanish. So I've got Rosetta Stone on the iPad. So after this call, it's that. Um, and I've just started a course on, I don't know if I can plug this app, but it's a Coursera. Okay. Um, but I'm paying for the app, so they're not sponsoring me or anything. But um, <laughs> there's, a, there's a well-being, uh, there's, a, there's a 
a lady called Laura Santos, and she's kind of the cutting edge of, of happiness science at Yale University. So I've just signed up to the course. It's two hours a week. So I'm going to do the first day today. Um, so that would be cool. Yeah. So it'll go along with my, I've got a lot of time meditating, uh, meditating and within the Buddhist tradition. So it'll be interesting to get a different perspective on science of the mind for me. Um, and then, yeah, exercise, walk the dog, make some dinner. Lovely. Eat, it yeah. It, Pretty it's good. Good. And I've signed up to Disney Plus. I've signed up to HBO. Netflix is in full go. So like, I've, I've found myself like feeling like, where are the hours gone? Mm. And I'm not, you know, training four hours a day anymore. And I still can't account for those extra four hours that I would feel I have. Yeah. Which is crazy. <laughs> but I suppose my new puppy's taking up quite a lot of the time, just stopping yeah. him from biting. <laughs> and what breed? What breed have you got? Uh, but Inu. Okay. I don't know. I could probably show you. He's literally asleep next to me. Hang on. Okay. If I can turn the camera around. I don't know if you can see. He's like hidden behind the chair. Underneath. Oh, he's yeah. Holding. Great. Yes. Just under the chair there. Yes. He's living the dream. There he is. <laughs> Fantastic. Good, good camera work. There. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think I have a future behind the camera. You'll have to uh, tidy up your desk for the next time. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, guys, thanks so much for your time. And uh, no obviously, yeah, good luck with sort of trying to keep fit and active and, and mentally well and everything like that. And uh, hopefully we'll see you back on a court very soon. Hope so. Cheers, guys. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Bye.